My name is James Slade. I'm a retired Command Sergeant Major. Uh, I was drafted in 1968 and in 1969 sent to Vietnam and I extended for two months and so I didn't return until uh, March of 1970 and uh, was wounded in January after I extended. <laughs> tell you back then and I guess it is still even today it's really a volunteer but what happened I'd already gone to jump school so I was airborne and I had a guy tell me he says if you join the Rangers at least probably every uh, one or two weeks you'd be able to come back and have a hot meal and a shower and everything at the rear I says okay that sounds good so I says okay I'll, I'll, I'll sign up and uh, so I signed up and went to their little training that they had it uh, in, over there in Vietnam and uh, uh, they signed me to the unit and then they didn't tell me though this is the most important part he told me that I might come back every two weeks but he didn't tell me that 80 percent of our company would get wounded <laughs> so it was a uh, we would go out in five man ranger team there was five of us on a team and uh, we would have a week to ten day mission and it was to gather information about the enemy. Sometimes it was to get POWs to bring back, to interrogate. Uh, we had all kinds of missions. One that really, really sticks in my mind, and the reason I stayed in the military for 30 years after, was that I, I felt that it was so important that once somebody gets trained, that they are obligated to pass that training on to the younger soldiers, the new guys. And uh, what happened is we had a mission where uh, the team was supposed to go in and they had to go get a POW. And uh, it was out of this village that was uh, kind of up in a mountain pass. And uh, this young man went out, his first mission. He was scared to death. Uh, the kid was only 18 years old. And he came to me and he's the night before he was supposed to leave and he said, can you get me out of this? He says, I had no idea. He said, I just thought I was gonna come over and get some medals and go home. He said, I didn't realize I could die. And he was very scared. And I said, look, you're already slated for this mission. There's nothing I can do. But I says, I'll talk to the commander as soon as you get back and see if there's something I can do to help you get out. Well, he went out on this mission and one of the things they used to just pound into us is not to give your, your uh, position away at night by firing your weapon. You threw grenades or something like that so nobody knew exactly where you were. Well, this kid goes out, two o'clock in the morning, he's pulling guard duty, and he hears a noise, and what had happened is the Vietnamese had seen this team go in. They knew somewhere where they were at, not exactly, so what they did is they herded a bunch of pigs up this valley, this little draw, to draw fire. Well, this kid had kind of dozed a little bit when he was on guard duty. And he, as soon as he woke up, he heard something running towards him, and it was a pig. But he didn't realize that. So he jumped up and started shooting. Well, as soon as he did, he gave away his position, and he got shot in the head. And. Um, I've often said, you know, I felt so bad about that that I should have maybe tried a little harder to get him out or something. But the, the thing that bothered me more than anything was nobody sat down and told him, don't do this at night. And I thought, if I can teach others just the rudimentary things that they need to do in a, in a combat situation, I might save a lot of people's lives. And, uh, and I, hopefully I did. I mean, I used most, most of my life, I trained and worked with soldiers and, uh, and very concerned about their, their well-being and their, their training because that would save their life someday. So that's how I trained them. And that story has always stuck in my mind. I thought, you know, that young man, he should have been a dad and a grandfather by now. But his life was taken because of a bad mistake. I want to help him still to this day. Uh, I built uh, a memorial there in the state of Utah, I helped uh, raise $420,000 to build a Vietnam memorial. And uh, we went through a lot of struggles and a lot of fights to get it done. We had to fight with the governor and the, all the politicians and 
They didn't want to put it where we wanted it and all this kind of stuff. And so it took us a long time to get this thing done. But by the time we did it, it's, it's one of the nicest ones in the country. But uh, it's just west of the state capitol building, right on the capitol grounds there. And uh, it's very nice, and it's a good tribute to the, uh, to the Vietnam vets. And uh, maybe, hopefully, the reason we did it was it's a healing process. Sometimes when people see a memorial and they say, yes, I participated in that, and it's all of a sudden they, they feel like that maybe people did appreciate it. I, I, just one last thing, maybe. I think I want to make sure that the Vietnam vets understand that people do honor them. They don't do these kinds of things like we're doing here right now out of pity. They do it out of a love for them for the service that they did. And I think sometimes our Vietnam vets still want to kind of hide in the background and they want to not talk about it. They want to not uh, put forth their ideas and their thoughts and I think that's wrong. They need to stick out their chest and say, we did serve. I was proud. We did what we were asked to do and we did it as good as any military people have ever done. And I think if they will do that in their own minds, that war can be justified to them much better and uh, the reasons that we were there. <laughs>